we had the gift and the curse. Yeah. And the gift is that we will do more than the average person because we have a, that, that burning desire to prove ourselves, so to prove to other people that, we, that we're worth it, that we matter. But the curse yeah. is that eventually when we hit that, the top, we're never gonna be fulfilled. My name is Raul Villases and you're listening to the Daily Edge Podcast. Learn the systems and the process that successful businessmen are using to take their lives and their business to the next level. Right, welcome to the Daily Edge Podcast. My name is Raul Villases, and today we have a guest that has impacted millions of people's lives, and he's in a journey to impact more people. And this man has come from from a similar background that I came from. And one of the reasons that I like to interview people like him is because is it creates the opportunity for us to learn that you don't have to go to college, you don't have to have all your shit together, you actually could fuck up many times and still <laughs> end up on top. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce you to Ryan Blair. Ryan, welcome to the Daily Edge podcast. And, and Ryan has been an entrepreneur for, for many decades. He built a company that was worth over $600 billion at one point, but he came from, from the background of being a gang member. And he wrote actually a book about being a gang member from, from gangs to millionaires. So welcome, Ryan, welcome. And thank you for doing this. Thank you, Raul, I appreciate it. It's an honor to be on the podcast and I appreciate all the hard work you do to put this thing together. So uh, I'm an open book, as you know, so I'm happy to share any wisdom I have or uh, any principles I have or any, anything that I can to help elevate your audience. So great, man. So listen, I could relate to your, to your message. I could relate to your story because as I was reading about your sermon, like, fuck, this guy looks like a, he's a brother from another mother. <laughs> because when, <laughs> when I came to this country, I was being bullied every single day, ever since from day one. And it wasn't until high school that I decided like, no more. I'm not gonna take this on. I started to fight back and I joined a gang and, and I was part of a gang, but it was, it was short lived. So thank God, because most of my friends mm -hmm. are either in jail or dead. So I, I was lucky enough that I was able to get out of that life, but tell us a little bit about how you got started and how, how that gang life began and, and why did it begin? Yeah, um, well the best, so the, the reason why it began was my sister got uh, uh, connected with the gang. She's half Latino. She was involved with a, uh, a group of people and next thing you know, her best friend was murdered in a drive-by shooting. And during that time, everyone was called to retaliate. Mm. But the real root of why I got involved in the gang is I didn't have a father involved in my life. Mm. I lost him when I was about 13 years old. We went from a middle-class environment where my mother and my father and the rest of my brothers and sisters lived to a uh, environment that was poverty. And as a result of that, you know, I was around the wrong people just by the fact that I lived in the wrong neighborhood. And next thing you know, I'm involved in a gang. And at first I was forced into it. I had no choice. And then, you know, from there I started becoming an enforcer. Uh, and I started going to juvenile hall, getting in and out of trouble. And, you know, and, and I thought I would become a professional criminal. I mean, that was what my life looked like. And I was pretty professional at it. I, I had a pretty large group that worked for me. And, you know, I, I learned a lot about leadership and running a gang and being involved in that activity uh, early on in my life. But I, I think that a lot of uh, young men uh, like yourself and like myself, like we just want to fit in. And, I, and like for me, I just wanted to be part of something. Even though I have a, had a family, my father was involved, my mother was involved, but, but for me it was part of being part of a community. Uh, yeah. And I look back on those days and I, as I you know, teach my son how to navigate through his teenage years, it's all about being an influencer. Uh, yeah. and I, let, I let myself be influenced by the people around me. And, and most of the time, like we discount the value of the associations. Like I used to give my mom uh, crap when she'd tell me like, tell me who you are and I'll tell you, tell me who you hang around with and I'll tell you who you are. I think, I don't yeah. know if it's a Spanish saying or it's, yeah. or it's a, a universal saying, but she always used to pick up my friends. She always would tell yeah. me that these guys are not good. And now I realize that, now I see that. And they were not, all my friends were not bad kids. We were just being influenced by older kids to join the game because eventually they wanted us to push drugs. They wanted us to push yeah. the product. And I remember going to a, a meeting and I didn't have the money to pay for the dues. I don't know if in, in, your, in your gang you have to pay dues, weekly dues or the meeting dues. So I asked my yeah. mother to let me borrow some money. So here I am, I'm a gangster, yeah. right? I'm a, I'm a gang member and my mom is letting me borrow money so I could pay my dues. So I wasn't really yeah. good at being a gang member like you. Yeah, yeah you know, you're, you're right. The, the number one driver for me, it was protection. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted protection. My um, you know, my first crush, the first kiss had, had been murdered in a drive-by shooting on the same street as me. So my primary driver's protection. 
But I realized that the older men inside the gang, they recruit young individuals to do their dirt and their dirty work and whether it be to you know do different rackets and we were required to produce a certain amount of a business activity so a gang is just simply a uh a an illegal enterprise hmm. and um and it's just for entrepreneurs that don't know how to do it legally and so once i learned about legal entrepreneurship i could transfer those skills real easily because mm-hmm. if you can do it illegally it's a lot harder to do it illegally than it is legally Absolutely, you know, man. Illegally, you have to worry about getting arrested. You have to worry about getting shot. You have to worry about you know people betraying you. You have to worry about your survival all the time. And legally, you don't have to worry about that stuff. You just have to worry about your your attitude. You have to worry about the actions that you take. You have to worry about you know you have to worry about the influences that you have. But you have much more control over your life legally than illegally. And if you have the hustle to to be part of a a, a gang or be part of a group, I mean, you have the hustle to become an entrepreneur. I truly believe that that you know if you have that grit if you have the minds of the street smarts to do something illegally just a matter of time that if you apply that energy to something that is is good and, and bring an, it brings an impact you're gonna have yeah. that much more success so so what was yeah. that that turning point for you the moment that you decide and you realize like shit this is not for me this life is not for yeah. me i'm gonna either, either end up in jail or or dead uh, how did you make that that turnaround yeah there, there's a couple of them um one was i was facing four years in prison and if I was to get the four years, I'd be transferred to adults. So I was a juvenile and I knew that I would, once I got transferred into the adult prison system in California, I'd be forced to become a professional criminal on the inside. And I had brothers and sisters that all had done long time. And I knew a lot of people doing time. So I knew that I had one last chance and I wrote the judge a long letter. And I remember writing it and rewriting it over and over. I was in juvenile hall. And the judge read it and he said, you should be writing in college, not in prison. And he granted me leniency. It was the first time a man had ever saw a talent in me. I'd I'd already been kicked out of high school. I'd already been in and out of juvenile hall. Uh, The police uh, and principals and teachers had already labeled me as a problem. And so I'd pretty much already given up on myself as had everybody else in our society. And then this judge says, wow. And I remember seeing the look on his face you should be writing in college, not in prison. And so that was, you know, a moment where I, uh, you know, I, I had to change, you know, touch my heart. I knew I had to change directions. But then the second moment was my mother started dating a rich real estate entrepreneur and I got to see the way the rich lived. So my mm. father was in the middle class, but when I lost him, I went to poverty. And so I saw poverty, but then I saw the way the wealthy lived and I realized, wow, these people are no smarter than me. And they live a lot better than any other model that I knew. And so I made it my life's mission to learn the model, uh, to reverse engineer it so that I too could be wealthy. Hmm. And so these are like, and, uh, you know, they're, they're moments that are divinely gifted to you. And I had a few of those interrupt my life and I received them and I took action on them. And so now I have a much different life. And every single one of us has those moments where we receive a gift, whether it be a challenge, right? You know, something devastating happens to us um, or we receive a blessing. Hmm. And if we really take that moment in and ask ourselves in a state of gratitude, what am I supposed to learn from this moment Hmm. and really drink deeply from it? We can change dramatically from those moments. And uh, I've had a number of them in my life that, that I was fortunate enough to, to, to seize and to, Hmm. to capture. And as a result of those moments, now I have, you know, great moments. That's awesome because you you actually received the blessing, the blessing of sometimes, you know, we look at life as, as catastrophes at the moment. You were facing jail time and you're probably wondering why this happened to me or why did I get caught or or, or why is God doing this to me? But yeah. you received a, a blessing or a message saying, you know, you could change your life. Like somebody had yeah. to believe in you. And I remember yeah. I remember clearly the day that I made a decision that the gang life or, or the streets life wasn't going to be for me is when my father was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. Uh, mm-hmm. The doctor came to me and had to translate to my dad that he was going to die young and I had to take care of him because he was going to be, be in a wheelchair. And as you know, my father passed away on Thanksgiving about a couple yeah. of weeks ago. And, and that moment changed my life. That moment yeah. I had to, had to really shift and become the man. And I think that that moment for you too, when you were facing jail time, you made a decision. Like, who am I yeah. going to be? Uh, and who am I going to become? And I think a lot of young kids don't see the challenges as a blessing don't see the opportunities yeah. that they have right now because they're so in focus 
on the darkness that they live in that they can yeah. see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Well, and it, you know, we pain, right? So we we don't really know how to process pain in our society. We're not taught it. Uh, for one, I want to acknowledge you. You know, the strength that you're showing right now, and the fact that your father just passed away, and I know how um, important he was to you. How you, he was your best friend, and and so you clearly have built process to deal with these types of pain and to realize that you know that if you address this pain and you heal this pain you will become stronger mm -hmm. and so clearly you're you know you're you're a hero to all of us who have lost our loved ones i lost my father and my mother and i didn't recover nearly as quickly as you have and so you clearly have these tools and have developed these tools and no doubt that's why you've been so successful you know with your edge program and your boot camps and your mastermind that you do and it's because you've built these tools and these foundational tools but what happens when we lose a loved one is we don't know how to to receive the, the blessing of the message. We don't know how to receive, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the challenge as a gift. Yeah. We, we get the challenge and then we say, why me? We get the challenge and, and we don't know how, you know, there's so much more life and death. Like there's only a little death in death, right? There's only a little bit of it, but there's so much more life in it. Mm. I get the chills all over me just saying that right now. Your father is right there next to you at all times now. And he can serve you in ways and, and, and his soul can do work in ways that it could not prior. And that's why his body, you know, that's why his soul had to leave his body so that he could continue on his journey. But if you don't know that philosophy, if you don't believe that to be true, if you don't have um, your spirituality in order with your mind and with your body, then when you get hit with these challenges, it wipes you out yeah. because, you know, you don't have any foundation to really stand on and to build from. And so clearly you, Raul, have that foundation. Mm, and you, I, I, I'm, I'm honored to be on this podcast right now. So, so soon after you have received this very difficult um, experience. But, you know, certainly it's an honor just to, to feel your strength at this time. Mm, thank you, brother. I appreciate it because, you know, you and I had this podcast scheduled the day after he died. And I was telling you before we came, actually came on the air that uh, I wanted to show up, I wanted to be here, and there was a battle between like what I want to, what I want to do, and what I can do. And sometimes you're right, as men, as entrepreneurs, we ca have to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. Uh, and yeah. one of the processes that I have every single day, you know, Ryan, is I put myself in that state of feeling the pain because this pain is never going to go away. People yeah. ask me all the time, Raúl, how are you creating videos? How are you showing up? How are you doing all these things when your father just passed away? And I and I tell him I I have pain. And I yeah. feel the pain, but I don't allow myself to suffer or stay yeah. in that suffering state. And yeah. I think that as a society, we've been addicted to not feel pain. You know, yeah. drugs, we take drugs because we don't want to feel the pain. We, yeah. we do anything else to, in order to avoid the pain. So we've been, we've been taught to manage the pain, to avoid the pain, at all costs, not to have pain. But I believe that pain could be a beautiful teacher. I, I did a video recently, death could be a beautiful teacher. And yeah. what I learned from, my, from, from this experience is that life continues to go on and the way to honor those who are no longer with us is that you have to show up like if, if it's your last day. And, yeah. and that's what I believe, that every single day could be my last. And, and I want people to understand that the pain that I'm feeling is never going to go away, but I'm going to use this pain for fuel. Just like you probably use your pain from losing your mother for fuel, losing your father yeah. for fuel, going through adversity for fuel. I think that's why entrepreneurship for me is the biggest spiritual journey. So, yeah. so, so tell me, yeah. tell, tell me, Ryan, and those for you who are listening right now, if you want to subscribe to the podcast, if you're watching this through Facebook, through Instagram, or through um, through YouTube, just make sure that you comment any questions. We will do a follow up, follow up interview with Ryan later on, and I love any questions that you guys have for him, any feedback that you could give us, because again, this podcast, this interview, I want to have an interaction with the with the listeners. I want to make sure that you are part of this conversation. And if you're going through pain, you're not alone. Most entrepreneurs, we go through a lot of shit, but we have to have processes that keeps us in the same path because nobody's checking up on us when we fail. Usually, you know, Ryan probably can relate that when, whenever you were going down the, the, the path of self-destruction, you probably would pretend that everything was okay, right? <laughs> and everything was okay from the outside, but inside is when we were crumbling. So give us a, an insight of, of what happened after you came out of a, of the gang and you decided to become an entrepreneur. How was your journey as an entrepreneur in yeah. the beginning? Well, I, you know, I, I, I want to share with you real quick on, on healing. So healing is painful. Hmm. Okay. And so when you feel that pain, you just have to change your mindset to say healing is painful. 
And so I got to the point where I channeled all the pain and the losses that I had to heal everything that was broken in me. You know, I had a broken hand from fighting as a kid. I don't know if you can see it, but I broke this hand five times. I was constantly fighting. I'd ruptured my patella tendon uh, playing basketball. And as I was suffering from the loss of my mother, I said, I'm going to utilize this pain to heal everything I can possibly find in my body and in my mind because the biology and the behavior, they're connected. Mm. So you, but the further you go, the further you see. So each step, the, each time you address the pain and you address the healing of the pain and you take that in and say, I'm going to use this pain to heal me in ways that maybe I didn't even know I was broken. Um, and the more that you do that, the stronger that you become. And the further you go, the further you see. So I just wanted to, you know, I, I, I have some principles on this subject because, you know, I play basketball, I do martial arts, I'm, I'm a very uh, physical person. And when I get injured, I have to address this pain. I say mm. healing is painful, mm. right? So I have to take the time to heal that pain. But then also sometimes things are painful. You're, you deal with um, uh, a difficulty in business. Uh, you deal with, in particular in our society, having run large companies. You have challenges with regard to hiring and scaling your business, receiving investor financing. Maybe you miss your numbers. Like, you know, sometimes business can be painful. Yeah. And healing is painful, right? So you just have to address that. But yeah, there's there's a number of principles that I've I've extracted from this experience of life that I've had. And what I like to do is just, I lead by my principles, right? My values drive my principles. And when I'm trying to lead myself and or others, it's all based on the principles that I have. And these mm. principles have been derived from lots of experience. But back to your initial question, you know, on, on self-destruction, uh, self I, I self-medicated, I used to party like a rock star. My mother was in a coma for two years mm. and uh, for a total of seven years, um, she was, so for seven years, she was severely handicapped. For two years, she was in a coma. And during that period of time, uh, when I review this past decade, you know, as we head into the year 2020, I look back at each year, all 10 of them, and ask myself, what are like the, the key points of those 10 years? And a lot of them, I look at it and say, wow, you know, I was hung over in that picture. Mm. Uh, I, I didn't show up to that meeting, you know, fully prepared and bring, you know, the energy that I should. Or I canceled these appointments, or I, I, you know, I was not operating at the highest capacity that I possibly could because I was trying to escape the pain mm. that I was enduring as opposed to greeting that pain as a lesson, you know, I tried to escape it. And so all too often, we don't want to address pain. We try to run from pain. We try to sedate pain. We try to hide from it. We try to tune out to it. We don't address the pain that we're dealing with. And if you address the pains, they, they go away. If you don't address them, they transmute themselves into other pain mm -hmm. and they get deeper. And pretty soon you have all kinds of traumas and all kinds of things stopping you from having the best mind, body and spirit connection you possibly can have. And so, you know, ultimately it's our societies and our cultures, um, our, our fear of pain, right? Our fear of death, our fear of life, right? That, that stops us from being the best version of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we're walking around sedated messes because we haven't addressed the pain within us. Mm. And it's, it's beautiful you said that because what, what, I'm, what I'm remembering is this past week and I was hanging around with uh, Joe, uh, the Senna, the founder of Spartan Race. I'm sure you, you heard of, of Joe. Yeah. And uh, he was telling me how he found a, a Spartan prayer. Uh, and the Spartan prayer, and I'm not going to repeat it word by word, but it was something like, you know, God, I know that, you know, you are running out of blessings because you probably already feed, you know, as much people as you could feed. You probably already gave love to as many people as you could give love. You probably get, already gave all your good blessings to other people. So what I'm praying for is give me all the bad shit. Give me yeah. all the pain that you could give me. Give me all the, the shit that you could throw at me because I know who I am. I'm a Spartan yeah. and I know I could yeah. take it. So I was, yeah. I was hearing that. I'm like, fuck, like, you're right. Yeah. Like, we are being conditioned to avoid yeah. pain. But the reality is that we're stronger than what we think we are. Yeah. And if well, we have know, that like mindset. The attitude, the attitude should be, let's go. Like, exactly. Right? So, you know, so, you know, when, take when it. The, the first thing yeah. that came through me on, on when I saw my father dying is like, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to have so much pain, but that pain is going to be so much more fuel for me to create an impact. And I did a video yeah. that I sent to my clients and, and it was in a state of, 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 of really, I was crying and I was, I was in the state of, of, of suffering. And I, and I listened to that video back that I sent to my clients and I said, my father died because he could only take me to a certain level as a human yeah. being. 
So now he had to die to go to the next level, the spiritual being to guide me in my journey. Yeah. And every yeah, time you- I listen to that video, it's like it's my it's, it's kind of like uh, God is speaking through my dad and saying it's gonna be okay. Just trust the process. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's where you're finding yourself now in a place where you have to trust the process. Trust the process yeah. that, that you evolve. Yeah, uh, you know, you, the, the spiritual connection that you have is ultimately, so the highest level that we can operate on is a connection to the source, the creator, to mother nature, to God, to whatever you want to call it. We all know that there, there are forces at work that you cannot see. And so whether you believe that that's the quantum field or you believe that's the Vedas or you believe that's the Bible or you believe that's Jesus or you believe, you know, that's that's Buddha or you believe that's Mohammed, there are forces at work that you cannot see. Mm. There's a consciousness that we know about. There's a connection that we have as as individuals, right, as 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 human beings. When I lost my mother, I could feel it in my navel. I could Mm. feel her soul leaving the physical realm and then I could feel something new. And so now my experience is I feel like I have a better relationship with my mother than I ever had. I have more gratitude for my mother and my father than I ever did. I've forgiven them and I've asked for forgiveness for every little detail that I could possibly think of because none of that matters once the person is elevated and they've passed away, right? All the things that we harbor, these parental traumas, all of that stuff, and you know this firsthand, once your your father elevates, like nothing, none of that matters because you would you would gladly receive any of those negative moments just to have another positive yeah. one in the physical flesh and blood. And you know that through the passing of a loved one uh, more than more than most people. So, you know, the, 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 those of us who know that there is a realm outside of this physical realm, and it's not that we believe, it's not just that we have faith, because we have faith which leads to belief, but then there's a level called knowing. When you have that knowing, you start walking with your intuition. You have to purify yourself. You can't be drinking. You have to restrict from negative energies, toxic people, sugar, um, bad foods, uh, whatever it is that your vices are. It could be pornography, could be um, lust, could be adultery, could be all, you know, there's all kinds of things that us men get challenged with. And we have to learn to restrict those things so that we can create a connection with the divine, with the creator. And when we have that connection with the creator and we can receive that through our parents, through our lost loved ones, through the, the people that have come into our lives and touched us and mentored us and helped us, we can receive those connections. If we do receive those connections then we're operating at a state of consciousness where you start to manifest things, where things just show up to you. And it really becomes about restricting and sharing. These are the two diametrically uh, opposed kind of forces. You have to restrict so that you can share. And you, when you share correctly, by restricting your ego and by restricting your desire to receive and you're sharing just purely like you did when you shared your feelings in the state of losing your father, right? You weren't doing that because you thought you were going to make the best looking video and because you thought people were going to like you more. You did that because you wanted your clients to know that no matter what they're going through, that they can power through this. And they're with a leader that's stepping up to the plate like a leader should. And so you wanted your clients to know that they had, they had a leader by example with them. Hmm. Right, and so you were called to create that video. You, 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 you didn't choose to create that video. It was like some guessing. You had to get that out of you. And I think that's where awareness. We're a place right now, especially with content. And and I look at you know people who are putting in content. And, and when I started putting in content, uh, it was it was that it was that it was a calling. Uh, and I and I wanted to touch on 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 the entrepreneurship side of of your experience because. I think that as entrepreneurs, we lose ourselves on the chase yeah. of success. And that's yeah. where I was when I started creating content five, six years ago. Actually, this week is going to be six years since I put my first event in Vegas. So the, the event in Vegas that I put, it was a very unconscious event. It was more like, yeah. let's just you know raise a bunch of money. Let's you know invest in real estate. Let's double down. Let's take advantage of the market. And I think at the end of the first... Uh, uh, the first uh, day or the second day, we actually went to a club at, at the Wynn Hotel and, and we just got bottle service. And I, and I look back and I'm like, fuck, like, like that's a whole journey. I've been through a whole yeah. journey of, of, yeah. of in, in, my, in my experience. But we all have to start with, we all have to start somewhere. Uh, and I want listeners to understand that in order for you to, to raise your level of consciousness, you have to experience pain. Uh, one yeah. of the things that I teach is if you want to grow, you have to break through that pain. 
So yeah. the moment that you feel pain, like for me, it was painful not to live my purpose. For me, it was painful not to make an impact. And that's the reason that I started putting content out there to be able to yeah. create that impact. So give us a little bit of insight, uh, Ryan, about how did you start your business? How, how, what, yeah. what made you start your business and what kind of business was it? Because I know that you know, you're going from a gang member to have a business that was valued at $600 million. It didn't happen because, yeah. you know, by yeah. coincidence, it happened by design. Yeah, well, so my, so I, I learned leadership in a gang. So if I could lead a hundred volunteers in a gang, which I had over a hundred people that reported to me, it was really easy for me to lead a hundred people in business, mm -hmm. um, much easier. So I, I was blessed to have some, some early, an early start in entrepreneurship. Uh, but my first company was a company called uh, 24 seven tech, which was a 24 hour a day technical uh, re uh, computer repair business. Mm. It didn't do very well, but I learned about, you know, finance and I learned about PR and, and uh, I invested in the business. I learned about sales. My second company was called sky pipeline. And it was, I started that when I was 21. I sold it when I was 24 in a $25 million transaction. Mm. And that was my first taste of, of real success. You know, when I realized, wow, if I could, create something that was worth $24 million, $25 million at 24, I could create something great. But then I had to humble myself. I lost it all. I spent money, you know, ir irrationally on bottle service. And, you know, and all bottle services is one entrepreneur taking money out of another entrepreneur's pocket. Right. Cause we know that, you know, that, that, that bottle of gray goose costs 40 bucks at Costco that you're paying a thousand dollars for. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so you're just being beaten by a smarter entrepreneur than you when you buy into that system. Uh, and, you know, and so I had to learn a lot of um, that the hard way, having come from poverty, you know, I had that mindset, I wanted to show off and, you know, I bought mansions and private jets and watches, you know, and had so many watches, that I never had any of them on time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, what is the purpose of this? Um, and so I, you know, my, my journey as an entrepreneur was, you know, I, I've had some pretty exceptional successes. My most Notable success was a company called uh, Vaisalis, which we created the Body by Vi 90 Day Challenge. And we were the first to integrate uh, a, a uh, challenge marketing in social media. Mm. So no one was us utilizing social media for monetization, for commercialization at the time. And no one was talking about their challenges on it. And so we had a group of, uh, you know, started with like 20 people and then it ended up being millions of people promoting our Body by Vi lifestyle on social media mm. and that business got to 65 million a month in sales and then I sold it. So I was able to scale that business and I sold that in 2012 and then I bought it back in 2014 and then sold it again in 2016. And uh, now I have a small ownership inside the business. Uh, but you know, I, I've, uh, I've been off of duty as a CEO for the past three years, really working on, you know, healing my mind, healing my body, and understanding the spirituality that I'd always known it was out there, but I didn't understand how it worked so that I could create this next uh, uh, iteration of my journey as an entrepreneur and as a leader and start helping others. Because listen, when, I'm, when I hear this type of success stories, man, it just, it just blows my mind how we could create even though we are not consciously creating a, the impact that we were born to create. Because I, yeah. I could relate, you know, creating a, a massive empire and losing everything and then looking back and saying, oh shit, like I did this half-ass. <laughs> I did yeah. this, you know, like maybe drunk or I did this maybe yeah. like not showing up. Like what's really possible if you put yeah. your entire intention and your entire focus and you actually pursue greatness instead of chasing success? Yeah. Yeah, the, you know, ambition is, uh, so I always wanted to be number one. Uh, I wanted to be number one New York Times bestselling author. I wanted to be number one in my industry. I wanted to be number one this, number one that. So ambition is a very important thing. The fuel to my ambition though is different now. My early fuel was I wanted to prove to everybody that I was right, that I was, you know, um, that I was enough. I wanted to prove to my father that I was, you know, that I was better than he thought I was. I wanted to prove to the teachers that said I would never amount to nothing. You know, I wanted to prove to the world that this college, this high school dropout could turn into a, you know, a, a NYSE publicly traded company CEO, which I was. So you know, the, the fuel for those things, it's important for you to really understand and be aware of what fuel is driving you. Yeah. I wasn't aware of it. And so, you know, I, I, I really exhausted those fuel sources. And then I decided when my mother had passed away and I knew she was going to pass away a year prior to when she did because she went on hospice. In fact, I thought it was going to happen much sooner than it did, but it, it, she was a year on hospice. 
And so during that year, I sold my interest in Vaisalis. I stepped down as the CEO of the company and I started really doing some internal work. And what I found was, you know, I, 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 had, um, I had created all of this success uh, based on the wrong fuel sources. Mm. And uh, I didn't value it. I didn't have the right friends. I had a bunch of fair weather friends around me, people that were there for the, the free, you know, private jet ride or the, you know, the bottle service or the, the free vacation or the lavish dinners. You know, I didn't really have substance and I didn't find value in being with myself. I was busy, but I wasn't fulfilled. Um, you know, I, I reevaluated everything and I took a vow of silence for uh, about 180 days where I didn't speak to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to, uh, you know, ask myself some deep questions. And during that time, I learned to listen. You know, I, I learned the biology behind listening. I learned the biology around your voice. I learned, you know, uh, I reread my books that I, that I had, uh, the books I'd written and the books that had impacted me. And I went back and I just wanted to reevaluate my entire life and ask myself, you know, what was the meaning of all of this? Mm. And so the meaning of all of these shortcomings and the meaning of these failures is for you to learn, right? And so, you know, as you're having these successes and you think that it's you, but you, you, it's not really you. It's what your soul came here to do that's mm. generating those successes. And so if you can put your ego aside and realize we are gifted to live in the best place in the history of the world. If you live in America or Western civilization, you live in the best place in the history of the world. We have more opportunity. There's you know, more of a chance for a person to go like I did or like you did from poverty to massive success than ever before in the history of the world. And as a result of that, a lot of times we take this for granted mm. and a lot of times we waste it. And so you know, as I went through this spiritual transformation, I realized all of the things, the sins, the mistakes, the errors, all of those were perfectly designed for me to be in a position now where I can lead people through those particular situations or help them prevent from doing the same mistakes that I had done, which is truly how conscious elevates. And, and isn't it crazy? I mean, like when, when I'm hearing your story, man, like I said, we were, we we're brothers from another mother because yeah. it doesn't make sense to the world. It doesn't make sense. When I started putting my content out there, when I started doing workshops, when I started putting seminars, people looked at me like, fuck, Raul, are you fucking crazy? Like, uh, like yeah. you have a real estate background, man. You can make, you know, 10 times more, uh, you know, in, in the real estate game. You know, if you put the emphasis of you putting in there, you could just build, you know, triple, quadruple your empire. And my answer was like, I'm not chasing, I'm creating. Yeah, and and all my that. life, you know, what I'm hearing you say is like, we were, we had the gift and the curse. Yeah. And the gift is that we will do more than the average person because we have a, that, that burning desire to prove ourselves, so to prove to other people that, we, that we're worth it, that we matter. But the curse yeah. is that eventually when we hit that, the top, we're never going to be fulfilled. Yeah. And I think that... Yeah, the, yeah the, you're absolutely right. It's a curse. I don't know how many times I sat there and said, I achieved this and I didn't get what I thought I was going to get out of it. You know, and big paydays, selling my company. You know, and, and then realize, wow, I sold this company because I wanted to be on a list. Hmm. I wanted to make the, the Forbes under 40 list. And, you know, and, and I, I did all these things because I wanted to impress other people. Hmm. Right. As opposed to realizing, like, I sold my company doing 100 million a year in profit and I got eight times. So it was 97 million a year in profit. So we got seven hundred ninety two point four million dollars. And I remember thinking to myself, I'll make all these lists and I'll be hmm. Uh, revered and so forth. And now, you know, eight years later, if I had just held on to the business, I'd have already made a uh, hundred million dollars a year and, and, and even maybe more hmm. and had a, t a ton more fulfillment. And, yeah. and, you know, and I realize now that selling the business was simply, you know, uh, an excuse for me to make a list and, uh, and enabled me to, uh, you know, waste time and waste my energy partying like a rock star and yeah. you know taking lavish vacations that you know that that were extreme and you know and and, uh, and it afforded me some great learning experiences but in retrospect now i realize that you know i was trying to do it to impress other people and i also structured things uh not knowing that i was going to have these different external pressures so pressures from investors to return investment pressures from venture capitalists things like that 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 you know drove me to sell the company and drove me to, you know, and, and I don't have any regrets uh, whatsoever because I wouldn't be doing the work I'm doing now with the clarity that I have now had I not gone through what I had gone through. 
But in retrospect, if we just know what our soul came here to do and we know what our purpose is mm -hmm. and we know how to do it, right? If you know what to do and you know how to do it, then you just have to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't necessarily know that, you know, that I was here to help people. And like you, I could have gotten back in the same industry, you know, the direct selling industry, you know, with what I know and, and what I've been able to create, I could easily create a several hundred million dollar company again. And, you know, I just wasn't called to do that. I have a huge respect and admiration for people that use that vehicle, but now I really want to work intimately and, and, you know, and help work with people on a much closer level rather than just on an economic level. But he, and you know, I, I do walked away from uh, hundreds of millions of dollars and, and potential upside to do the work I knew my soul was called to do. And here's why I want every listener to understand that you can't put price on fulfillment. You cannot put price on living your purpose. People ask me all the time, Raul, you know, how much money are you making or how, or, or how, you know, how are you building this? I said, it doesn't fucking matter how much money I make. It doesn't matter how much I'm worth. What matters is how fulfilled I am, the legacy that I'm creating, the impact that I'm making. You can't buy that shit. Understand, yeah. we, are, we have to start rethinking what success really means. Like yeah. if every single day you wake up and you're fucking energized to go to work, energized to fulfill your purpose, energized to do what, and you're impacting people and you're doing it legally, shit, you made it. Yeah. You yeah. fucking won. Yeah, I'll tell you, there's what? been days where I had $10 million hit my account and the only thing I could think about was, you know, parting my face off and getting drunk and I'd be hungover for five or six days later. And, yeah. you know, now there's days where I have, you know, good wins and money hits my bank account and I just think about how can I utilize this to serve more how can I utilize this to connect with more individuals and expand my purpose? And so for those people out there that are, you know, that, that, that either have money, uh, you know, they can attest to it. It, it doesn't make you any happier. No. The more that you no. have, it doesn't make you happier. What I, makes you happy is how you share that wealth and how you, you know, and the work that you do, the physical energy that you put into the work that you do. If, if you see the reward in that by way of fulfilling other people and making an impact, the money will come. And then when it comes, you then have an economic engine to help propel that sharing. And so if you just really see it as, as you know, it's, it's an energy. Yeah. And if you harness that energy correctly, it can, it, can, it can help you receive more of it. And the more that you receive, the more that you can share. And the more that you share, the more that you receive. And so you're really, all we're trying to do is just get that harmonization with the economics of the industries that we're in or the work that we do so that we can actually share more and give more and, and, and be able to have fulfillment. And by fulfillment, be there for our children when our children need us, be there for our family when our family need us. Take the time to ourselves. You know, if you have to invest in yourself and you need to take seven days to you know, go get your mind and your body and your soul right, you, know, you should be able to do that. Hmm. You should not be questioning whether or not you can take the time to invest in yourself. Because believe me, the only regret that I have and in, in the journey that I've had so far as an entrepreneur for over 20 years is, you know, I didn't put enough time into myself, mm. right? I, cause I gave that time to everybody else. I gave that time, uh, you know, to building the company. I gave that time to investors. I gave that time to my sales force, which was all around the world and, and, you know, numbered hundreds of thousands of people as opposed to putting that time into myself. Mm. And now I realize the more I invest in myself, the more I can invest in others. And so you just have to get that restriction. Investing in yourself is a form of restriction, hmm. right? Because we just want to give, we want to share, we want to go out there. And investing in yourself is meditating. Investing in yourself is taking time and being in nature. It's doing events and experiences like you offer, right? That's an investment in yourself, which is restricting from maybe taking a, re a vacation to Italy and having lavish time and eating all kinds of food and having you know, great experiences. Those are great. You need to do those things but you need to do an equal amount of investing in yourself uh, solely for the purpose of receiving, uh, you know, the wisdom that, that programs like yours teach and receiving the, the camaraderie and the community that programs like yours offer. And so if you don't do that, you will regret it because the more that you invest in yourself, the more you can invest in others. And, and I think that the mentality of people have, the average mentality is what can I get and how fast I could get it. When the reality yeah. is that you listen right now to somebody who's who's been through through hell and back and has created a massive success is that when you switch the mentality instead of what you could get is what you could give because you could never outgive God. Life is always gonna give you what you're willing to give life. 
and investing yeah. in yourself, investing in your in your processes is probably the best investment you could do. Why? Because you you growing, you expanding. Yeah. And I tell my wife all yeah. the time, like I need to get if I don't get physically strong, mentally strong, emotionally strong, and spiritually strong, shit, like the whole kingdom will fall down. Yeah. So I need to yeah. make sure that I stay, I invest in myself constantly because I know that if I don't show up 100%, nobody's going to do it for me. And I think that right now we're in a society that people want other people to do the work for them. I get yeah. thousands of applications, Ryan, thousands of people who apply for my program. And when it comes to, yeah. to really seeing like if they have what it takes, most people want the magic pill. Most people want the shit to happen easily and, and success is not easy. I just did a, a video that we were marketing the next level leadership and I talked about how we are addicted to motivation. Motivation yeah, is that. not the key. Motivation yeah. actually gives you a false sense of certainty. Every yeah. successful entrepreneur, the reason that we don't need motivation is because we know that it, sometimes we don't feel like doing it. Sometimes yeah. we don't feel like showing up, but there's we have to push ourselves to show up. That's yeah. what feeling the pain looks like. You have to show up even if you don't feel like doing it. And when yeah. you pain, well, you're doing that, like you're doing that right now, Raul. The I saw the video and I agree with you. You're in a state of activation, mm -hmm. right? So you know, motivation is great. You know, watch a good movie, read a good book. You know, uh, attend a seminar. Motivation should be 10% of your driver in life, mm -hmm. right? It's nice to have sources of things that give you little bit of motivation here and there but activation is when you show up just a couple of weeks like you are right now and you're doing the work that you're doing just a couple of weeks after your father has passed away who's so close to you that is a level of activation mm. right that that's that's and you know i have friends that are motivational speakers and i know a lot of people in in that particular game and they have a role mm. but like what we're trying to do in the work that we do is we're trying to maintain a state of activation yes and so you know, the people that I work with, they're, they're not going to get a motivational pep talk from me. They're going to, you know, I'm going to tell them they need to activate themselves. And how do you do that? One, you have to get the negative out of you so that you can be filled with the light and be filled with the positive. And the way you get the negative out of you is you have to work out. You have to push your body into, you know, limits that you haven't pushed it. You have to put, push yourself to a level of physical exertion and physical excellence. So that way you get the negative and the things out of your system that are blocking you from receiving more light and receiving more of the positivity. Life is about negative and positive. Mm -hmm. You have to constantly discharge the negative. You have to cleanse it and you have to get it out of you because the world fills you up with negative. The water we drink, the air we breathe, we can't control it. We get negativity from the people, from the culture, from the news, right? There's so many things, social media, our, you know, our friends and family come home and they throw negative at us. And, you know, and that's human nature as we receive it. Our job is to discharge that negative, uh, uh, that negative nature, that negative inclination, the negative toxicity in our foods and the things that we eat. And the way we do that is through an active program in our in our bodies and through an active program in our minds, and then you know through activity in our our spirituality to make sure that we're always connected to the higher purpose as to why we're here. And so, if you can dial those three subjects mm -hmm. in constantly, uh, you're going to continue to elevate. But it's mm -hmm. when one gets out of whack. Like people would always uh, be mad at me or, you know, why do I spend so much time in the gym? Because I knew that if I was, whatever I had to get out of me, you know, that I was getting out of me in the gym and the strength that I was building in there, I knew that that was going to make me stronger mentally. And you want a leader strong mentally, but all too often we sacrifice our workouts. Uh, we sacrifice our joys, like the creation of music is a joy of mine. Um, you know, I have other joys like playing basketball. And I say to myself, oh, I'm not going to be able to play basketball because I have to go, you know, be a stronger leader to my team. And that's not the case. The joy I receive from playing basketball makes me a stronger leader to my team, right? So all of these things build you into being the best leader. But what happens is, is we, we believe other people's bullshit about these subjects. We allow other people that don't value their bodies or don't value their mindset to project onto us. And we take the wrong advice from the wrong people. And next thing you know, you know, we, we're living in stagnation. We're not purpose driven. We're getting injury. We're getting sick. We're getting ailments. We're getting fired. We're going through divorces. We're going through breakups. We're turning to the bottle, right? Why? Because we didn't realize I got to get negative stuff out of me to get positive stuff in me. Hmm. One of the things that I'm learning about you is that we could spend so much time building our business that we neglect of building ourselves. Yeah. And I think you are that your business. 
I, and I think that you you you're hitting a point right there. It's not about motivation. It's not about just taking action for the sake of action. It's about emotional and spiritual fitness. Yeah. And as entrepreneurs, no, we need to make sure that we build in the empire from the inside out. Yeah. Because otherwise, well, we're gonna build an empire outside, and yeah. we're not gonna like the way it looks. That's what I did. I built this beautiful outside empire, mansions and private jets, and and I looked at it and I said, I would burn all of this up to have more time with my mother. Hmm. I'd burn all of this up to have more time. My son has autism, and thank God I've been able to get him uh, the healing that he needs, and he's elevating. But like, I would burn all of this stuff up hmm. to know without a doubt that my son would catch up in school and accelerate in school and have a healthy life and not have to be burdened with the consequences of a neurological disorder. And so I realized all that outside in stuff is, is you know, that's society, that's the culture that we live in, trying to tell you that, you know, that, that you need these, these material items to be happy and fulfilled and you don't. As entrepreneurs, it's real simple. We are problem solvers. Hmm. So an entrepreneur is a problem solver. So the world, the universe needs a lot of problems solved. Humanity has created a whole lot of problems. And so humanity has to fix those problems, right? Otherwise, the environment will do the fixing for us, right? The hurricanes will come, you know, if we don't fix the environment, the environment's going to fix us, right? One way or the other. Hmm. If we don't fix the pollution, the pollution gets into our water and then we get damaged and we become unhealthy, right? We have to fix it. And entrepreneurs are the people who do the fixing that the universe needs. So you are called to fix something. And so your job is to be the best problem solver you possibly can be. Mm. And so if you're dealing with all these problems on the inside, how can you solve all these problems on the outside effectively, right? So I just look at it real simple, and this is back to our first uh, uh, discussion about gangs. When you're in a gang, you're just creating big problems. And if you're capable of creating a big problem, you're equally capable of creating a big solution. Mm. Entrepreneurs are just creating big solutions to problems, right? And so all you have to ask yourself when you wake up every day is, are you passionate about the problem that you're solving? Mm. Do you know what to do and how to do it? And just try to get better at solving that problem every single day mm. and make sure that you aren't the problem. Yeah. I get, I get right? out of the way. Don't make yeah. problems. Don't, don't create, because sometimes entrepreneurs, we create problems where there are no problems in, yeah. in our business. I mean, we- Never we, make matters worse. Yes. Right? But rule number one, if there's a problem, rule number one is never make matters worse, right? <laughs> Do everything you can to make matters better. Uh, that's rule number one. So, so let me, let, let's, let's give some, some of the listeners um, some insights of 2020. So for the yeah. guys who are listening to this podcast and the people who are listening or watching this through YouTube, what, give them three things that they could prepare themselves for 2020. What are you doing in 2020? What are the, the key things that you're preparing yourself for 2020? And how can you help uh, a guy who's listening to this and he's an entrepreneur and he, he's probably stressed out and he's probably like trying to figure shit out in 2020 and trying to make the 2020 the yeah. best year of his life? Give him three things so, so he could have the takeaways in order for him to execute. Okay, so number one, reflect on what I'm doing right now, and I've spent a fair amount of time. I went back through my Instagram, which is a great uh, uh, scrapbook, right, of our lives and how we're thinking and what we're thinking. Go back through the past decade. I happen to have uh, had Instagram for almost a decade. And so, you know, and then do a, a, an audit, right? Look through it, ask yourself, what are you happy about? What are you not happy about? Um, and it, it, do some soul searching. Like you should be looking at this saying, wow, have I come a long way in the past decade, right? And boy, am I not going to repeat the same things I did last decade and the next decade. Uh, two, uh, take inventory each year. So what were the highlights? What were the, the demarcation points in 2010, 2011, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so forth? And then where are you today? And the very fact that you're watching this right now and the very fact that you're open to new information and the very fact that you're in a growth mode because you have to be if you're subscribing to this program, you know, means that you're ready to learn, you're ready to grow. Okay, so great, let's close last the last decade, let's close, you know, the last year of 2019 and close the last decade. And then now let's forward project. Mm. And I go out the entire 10 years and I just say, based on the last 10 years, what I wanna see the next 10 years look like, mm. right? You know, it's real simple. And then I visualize myself out in the next 10 years because when you have, I have 20 years of this, so I've, I've done this reflection for two decades now and I'm going on to my third decade. And so I realized decade moves very quickly. Mm, yep. Like you'd be surprised. You're going to look back from this day right now, this message that you're receiving from Raul and I a decade from now, and you're going to say, this was a pivotal moment 
and my learning and my growth and my commitment to take action. And then you look and just say each year, what's that going to look like? You know, how am I going to continue to show up? Mm -hmm. And don't focus on the money, focus on the activity that generates the money. So if my job is to uh, serve 20 clients a month and I want to grow that to serving 25 clients a month and then 30 clients a month and then 40 clients a month or whatever the numbers are that you're working with, focus on the service. Don't focus on the money, focus on the thing that drives the money. Mm -hmm. And if you get better at that thing that drives the money, because money doesn't lead, it follows. So all too often we do these projections, I'm going to be a millionaire by this time, but we don't actually work on the things that drive the projections, right? So if, if our job is to acquire 10 new customers per month, you know, you have to talk to hundred people to acquire those 10 new customers per month. If you acquire those 10 new customers, you make your revenue line, right? So, you know, what are the activities that you need to do? And then in order to do those activities, what energy do you need to bring? And so invest in your body and in your mind, like it's a source of energy. Time hmm. management management is a bit of a farce. It's energy management hmm. because you don't want to be, you know, uh, looking at your life and saying, how do I manage my time? You want to manage your energy so that way you feel like each day is timeless. Hmm. Like you're doing the work that you need to do, that you know you're here to do. You're fulfilled from that work and you're getting the results from that work. And so, you know, I like to audit the past 10 years and then future project them. And then I do a very deep state of visualization on what I see in the next 10 years. Hmm. And, uh, and I, I take it year by year. So that's what I would do for every single person knowing what I know now going on my third decade of, as being an entrepreneur. That's awesome. I believe in creating a vision. I think we underestimate what we could do in a decade. And I look back in the last decade, like, fuck, 10 years ago. I think 10 years ago, we were just coming out of the crash. I mean, it was no. 2010. We were trying to figure shit out. And and now looking looking back is so many lessons, so many beautiful magic magic moments. And and I want everyone who lives who listens to us to understand that time, it, yeah. it, it, it it can you can't freeze time. Time yeah. continues to move. Time is always is always going. You can't put a pause. It's not a movie that you could put pause on. So at the yeah. end, you either keep on moving with the changes, or get the fuck out of the way, <laughs> because yeah. life yeah. will just yeah. like money will find a way to. To, to find its place with the right owner, just like yeah. energy will find its place. So thank you, brother. Thank you for being here. And I can't wait to to, to get to know you more. And, and hopefully you could join us at the Next Level Leadership Summit in March. And, yeah. Uh, I, and brother, I'm here to serve you and your audience. Uh, what you went through right now, I, having having just weathered that storm and to anybody out there going through grief, this is what, you know, this is what this this, this family is about that you put together, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an amazing thing that you've done. So I'm a fan of yours. And I'm here to serve any way that I possibly can with you. Thank you, well, I appreciate it. So for you guys who are watching this or you are listening to this, just make sure you subscribe, you comment and follow us. Make sure that you follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, everywhere else to make sure that we give you the best every single time and bring in the best people that are, that are in, my, in my network, in my association, because I believe that proximity is power. And the only way to go to the next level is to make sure that you have a purpose and you feel your purpose every single day to have the edge. Have an amazing day. Learn it. Live it, experience it, love life.